chapter 6. This is a relatively big chapter. Bond markets. Actually, the biggest markets in the world are the bond markets. So they are by far the biggest globe. The second characteristic which follows out of this, the bond markets are the most important. Somehow people follow the stock markets and think that the stock market is important. The short answer is no, not so important. The, short, the stock market is too small, too insignificant. Actually, you may have countries without a stock market and the economy can function very well. Okay? It's the bond market that really matters. In other words, what matters most in an economy are the capital markets. So, now we're getting to a brand new thing, capital. Markets and capital markets will be chapter Six. Remember, chapter five was money markets. Chapter seven. And chapter eight. Capital markets provide long-term funding for usually long-term investments. Hey, guys. You guys gonna separate or one of you move on the up front here? Yeah, one of the two. Whichever. Uh, so chapter six is about mortgages. Let's see. Oh, sorry, chapter six is about bonds. Chapter seven is about mortgages. And chapter eight is about Stocks, and that's what we're going to be going over the next so many weeks. Okay? So, uh, capital markets are about capital expenditure. Capital expenditure is an expense or the purchase of a long-term asset expected to bring long-term returns. Example of a simple capital expenditure will be buying a projector, buying a car is in a taxi, buying a truck for shipping, okay? Uh, for an airline, the biggest capital expenditure is the airplane itself. Another major capital expenditure, whether it's for a country or a corporation, is an airport, okay? Or a shipyard, okay? Capital expenditure is associated with any kind of machines, equipment, or real estate that will be used for many years or probably for many, many decades. Capital expenditure is what common people incorrectly call investments. Okay. Uh, investment means something else. Investment is a is you actually buy an asset for its return. With a capital expenditure, you actually buy the asset 
to use the asset. If it's a car, you're actually going to be driving or going to have a driver to drive a car. So capital expenditure is associated with a business, with economic activity. Okay. So, back to the bond. What is a bond? It's a long-term obligation. That's it. Long-term obligation, if you want to add, issued by corporations or governments. That's all. The bond will have a face value usually a thousand but it could be a million it's usually a nice beautiful round number of hundred thousand one million okay and it will have a coupon and coupon rate Coupon rate. And there are many ways to classify bonds, but the most common one is into, uh, let's see, treasury. The second group will be municipal. So we can say treasury bonds. Municipal bonds. And the last one is corporate bonds. And now we basically go through each of these three. It's going to take maybe two hours, maybe three hours. Today we'll probably just be able to do the treasury bonds on because it's long, it's difficult. Okay, uh, beginning with the treasury bonds, we've clarified that the bonds will fall into two categories. We call these T. Bonds and treasury or T notes. The notes will be called the financial instrument of uh, one to ten years of maturity. And the T bonds will be ten. Plus. So this is just easier way to differentiate them. It's kind of like students. Maybe you're sophomores, maybe you're junior, right? It's just the convenience terminology. Okay. That will be section number two. Treasuries. I already explained they could be notes, they could be bonds. They are issued by the central government. It is usually used to, we say, fund 
fund, meaning to raise funds, to raise money for the national debt. Governments are in the business of spending money. That's what governments do. Governments are always short on money, and governments borrow. The amount of money that they borrow each year, or the amount of money that they spend more than they get. So let's try to do this now. You have government revenue. government revenues, the amount of money that the government collects from people, businesses and everybody else. Then we have government expenditures. And the difference between the revenue and expenditure becomes the surplus if it is positive and deficit if it is negative. The word government becomes fiscal. Fiscal means of the government becomes fiscal almost always deficit and rarely a surplus. The fiscal deficit is for one year or for one period. So, a one way to think about the national debt, a way to think about national debt, is that the national debt is all the money that you owe. And that will include the deficit of 2000, let's say 15 last year, plus the deficit of the previous year. including the interest on those deficits. And government usually uses long-term bonds to finance or to fund those deficits. Uh, I did uh, before, uh, they are, we say, default-free. Now it's important to understand, and that's very tricky. It's important to understand. They have their they have no risk of default. Here's the thing: for the U.S. government issuing in U.S. dollars. Now for the government of Nigeria issuing in U.S. dollars, they have a high risk of default. And the government of Nigeria loves to default. Yeah. Now, for the government of Mexico issuing Mexican government bonds on with, sorry, payable in U.S. dollars, are also have a lot of risk of default because the Mexican government cannot print dollars. So when they run out of dollars, they go bankrupt. So the Mexican government has also gone quite a few times in default. Uh, well, one of the previous times was 1994.
explore. Of course, Argentina would borrow uh, in dollars, and Argentina has gone many, many, many times in default and therefore bankrupt through bankruptcy. So, a lot of countries which issue in dollars, of course, that will be your own government, because the government cannot print the dollars, can easily default. And they do very often default. Except the American government, because the, when the American government needs the money and it doesn't have it, it will just print it. The system is designed by purpose not to be fair so that the Americans can print money whenever they want, but you can't print dollars whenever you want, okay? Or your government can print your own, its own currency, but most people are not willing to accept the currency and to keep the currency. You'd rather change them back for dollars and hold dollars, because dollars are better than the local currency, at least loses value slower. In other words, the local currency loses value, the dollar loses value, and you want to hold what's called the lesser of two evils. Both of them are going to lose value, but with the dollar, you are likely to lose less value. The value on the dollar, the value on the dollar, is called, or any other currency or local currency, is called exchange rate. The exchange rate of the local currency recently was about 4,000 to the dollar. Okay? And when you hold the currency, you get an exchange rate risk. You hold an exchange rate risk. So the exchange rate risk is sometimes called for short currency risk. Okay. So the US government does not have, because it issues in its own currency, does not have or face exchange rate risk, does not face currency risk, okay? But all the other countries issuing in dollars do face it. When Japan issues debt in dollars, they face the same. When they issue debt in their own Japanese yen, they, again, are considered to be default-free. So whenever a government, whenever a government issues debt, they want to issue it in their own currency. The problem is that most investors are not willing to take the currency risk by buying the government's debt in its own currency. Okay? So, that's the characteristic of default-free. Default-free does not mean risk-free. I already explained that before. It can still have interest rate risk, it can still have currency risk. There is a risk that the dollar will fall in value. Okay, that's a possibility. A lot of investors in Britain, now the British pound falls in value, so a lot of investors are discovering currency risk and taking a lot of losses on the British pound. Okay, back to bonds. But most bonds are highly liquid, but there is a little trick there. It's what's called the issue bond, it will be issued, they're called on the run. On the run issues, and the other one will be off the run issues. On the run issue is a bond that was issued recently, just a few days or a few weeks, possibly a few months ago. So, on the run, think of it as recently issued. And off the run are relatively old, maybe issued years ago. So, 
on the run will be relatively liquid, let's say highly liquid. Mostly because they are in demand. And off the run will be relatively illiquid. They may be 30 year bonds and they've been already outstanding for 18 years and I got 12 years left or 7 years left for them. 3 years and 3 months. So these are little traded, relatively little traded, and relatively illiquid. If you want to sell them, there is still a possibility to sell them, but it's not as quick, it's not as easy. These are high liquid, very quick, very easy to sell. Okay, the next simple characteristic is that the coupon is semi-annual or in British you can say semi-annual semi-annual means half a year so they're getting paid every half a year which is the same as every six months so they pay twice a year this is only specific for Again? Uh, the semi-annual is the only specific for oh. No, no, no. This is semi-annual coupon. Coupon. A bond will usually pay a coupon. The coupon payment is made twice a year. For every time? Huh? For every time bonds? For, for practically all government bonds and most notes okay they'll be paying coupon it's one of the good ideas about owning a bond is that the government will send you money every six months so if you're retired you may have one million dollars invested in government bonds every six months the government will be sending you some money let's say at five percent it will be sending you up for one year at five percent it's going to be what fifty thousand so every month it's going to be sending you maybe four thousand dollars every month so that's the idea the idea is you get current income and at the end of the period you still get your money back then you can reinvest it in anything else you want Okay, let's see what else we got. Uh, some bonds are called, some bonds are called fixed principal. You will basically, the face value is thousand and you're going to get one thousand. That's it. Doesn't matter what the inflation rate is. And other bonds will be inflation protected. Inflation protected, sometimes it's called inflation indexed. The interest or the principal or maybe both of them will be adjusted for some inflation index. Usually when inflation begins to run very high because the government prints a lot of money, investors begin to lose money and begin to lose confidence in the government, which happens all the time around the world as the government's like, Mexico, Argentina, okay, which are not trustworthy, not reliable. The government likes to print money, people lose money, they lose confidence, and the government begins to promise some indexation. In other words, they're going to compensate you for inflation. 
So they devise an index, inflation index, to protect people. Well, here's the next thing. The governments usually fool people into thinking that they get protection by inflation because they say, oh, we give you protection for inflation, but people don't look into how the index is calculated. So that the real inflation may be 10%, but when the government calculates it, it includes a table and a piano, okay, whose price did not go up. They don't include things like gasoline and electricity and rice and bread, things that people. So the government calculates inflation at 5%, but the true inflation is 10%. And a lot of people get fooled into thinking that they have protection against inflation, when in reality, it's only a small, partial protection. And that's the way the game is played. The trick is again the same, to screw the investors. Okay, that's what the government is doing. So, every gain for the government is a loss for the investor. Remember, the opposite is true. Every gain for the investor is a loss for the government. So the government's gain is to transfer losses onto its own investors. And of course, the second game is to make promises, make more promises, make bigger promises. Well, that's the national debt. The national debt is simply promise. Trust us, we'll pay you more in the future. Maybe. Okay, let's see. Well, over time, it has been discovered, over time, that some investors like only or want, prefer only the regular income of the coupon. And other investors prefer only the money coming at the very end in the principal. So, some people want to get the bond, collect the interest, and then collect the principal at the very end, but others want to collect only the interest. They don't want the so, a new security is called a strip. It's a special type of a security. And the process is called stripping. To strip means to separate, to remove. So you can strip your shirt, okay? Is to remove the coupon from the bond. So stripping is the process of separating coupons and packaging them. So you separate, you take all the coupons and you package them in one package and separately the face value. into a different security. So you take one bond, you strip it and make two out of it. One only for the interest payments and another only for the face value. Some people will prefer only the coupons and collect the coupons only. Others will prefer only the face value. So those who collect the coupons they want, it's called current income. Think of an old retired person, he saved some money, he cares about getting every six months current income. And the face value, for example, could be a 10 year bond or a 20 year bond or 30 year bond, you don't get anything and after 20 years you get the face back. So this is for true real 
long-term investing. So the purpose here is actually investing. So when you strip the coupons, they call it, uh, let's see now, treasury zero coupon bonds. Treasury zero coupon bond. That's a zero coupon bond means no coupons. Refers only to the face value. So the portion that contains the face value we'll call treasury zero coupon bonds. And the other one's going to be treasury zero bonds. Treasury zero bonds are bonds that pay only coupon. Zero refers to no. Base then no face value means coupon only. Okay. By uh, when you mean that they only want a coupon, so even if after the bond mature, they don't get the principal back. Correct. They get only the interest. Correct. And for the face value, will they have any return for if they only want the face value back? Okay, well, let's try to do this. Uh, again, I'm picking number for you to understand. If you're buying the, let's say, the face value only, you may actually pay $500. Let's say you do this. $400 for the face value, you get zero interest all the time, and for the 400 face value, eventually you're going to get a face value of 1000 Now, the interest payments, they, let's say 30 years of interest payments, there's going to be a lot of interest payments, another investor will pay about 600 so, you didn't actually pay 1000 When you pay 1000 you will get $600 worth of interest over these 30 years. And at the end of 30 years, you're going to get only $200, sorry, $400 of face value. You get paid 1000 but when you take the present value of 1000 today, it's only 400 so, when you bought only the face value, you paid only for the face value. You did not pay the full price. And when you bought only the, what is the coupons, you paid only for the coupons, you didn't pay for the face value. Okay? Well, now the question is, uh, who does this? originally and now is done by an investment bank and if the bond is worth let's say 1000 and the value is 400 the investment bank will strip it for you it will package it and it will sell it to you for 402 and when it strips the coupons it will sell them for 603, okay? And the difference between what the investment bank will purchase it and then sell the strict parts, okay, will be the investment bank's profit over those years. So that's what the investment bank is doing. Now let's see again your question. What's the question again? I just want to know the return for the investor if they want to purchase this two-time bond. 
the return will be usually the same. It's the question is not how much is the return, is when it comes over time. If you are, let's say, a pension fund and you got to make payments now, you will purchase the coupons only and use the coupons to make the payments. If you're a pension fund and you have young people and you don't have to make any payments, then you're going to buy only the face value. The return is always the same, maybe 6% or 3%, whatever the return on government bonds is. The only difference is how you spread the payments over time. That's the only difference. Now, in other words, some people prefer the current payments and they don't want the big face value at the end. And other investors prefer the opposite. They say, I don't want the. For example, think of it as me. I have a current income, I have salary, I have all the other things. Uh, I expect to retire in 20 years, okay? And if I invest in a bond, I don't need the interest. I don't expect to spend the interest. So when I buy a government bond, I would prefer to buy only the face value for 400, expecting 20 years from now to get maybe 1,000 back that the government will not default. So different people have different maturity Preference. Let's write that out. Maturity preference. Some investors prefer short maturities with regular payments. Other investors prefer very long maturities with no payments. There's a difference between a 20-year-old investor and 65-year-old investor. Okay. Maturity preference is determined or dictated in finance. You should have studied. You just studied duration. Duration. is the average cash flow of a security. The average cash flow, the period of cash flow in a security. So, some retirement accounts would want to have only the face value. Some insurance companies would want to have only the face value. They want to invest long term. Pension funds will also want to have the face value. And some use these also for uh, what's called hedging interest rate risk. I don't want to get into that. It's too uh, complicated. Okay, the next concept is that of accrued interest. Accrued interest is the interest which accumulates after the last payment of interest until the point of sale. So, let's draw a picture. Okay, we'll keep the picture like this. So, think of it. Payments are made January 1, then they're made July 1, January 1, July 1. So, there is an interest payment over here and an interest payment over here. 
let's say the coupon rate is 3%. This is a semi-annual payment. So the payment will equal to $30. So every six months the bond pays $30. So every year it pays $60, about 6%. And now the bond is sold, let's say, March. March 1. When you sell it at March, this means that you held it for two months. So you will earn some interest. In other words, you purchased the bond last time you collected your interest in January 1 now you sell it in March 1 and in March 1 you still earn some income but it's not paid you earn interest but it's not paid well how much interest is earned until March 1 how much interest anyone any guess huh is it? Is it 15? Well, let's try it. Huh? So the accrued interest will be 29. Okay, 29. So if it's sold on, let's say, April 20, how much it will it be? April, sorry, January 20, it will be. 20 out of 30 divided by 5. What does it make? 3. Huh? 3 point something. 3 point something. We say approximately $3. Well, that's the crude interest. Well, now comes the next thing. When a bond is sold, 
the price should include the accrued interest. Okay? So a bond now has two prices. The price with accrued interest and the price without accrued interest. Okay, now I can do this. So, let's try to do this. You have what's called a Full price is the price of a bond which also includes accrued interest. This full price is known as dirty price. That's how I like to call it. And the other one is called the, or the clean price. Okay. And the difference between the dirty price and the clean price is the accrued interest. Now, a different way of saying is that clean price plus accrued interest gives you the dirty price. If the bond will again, you gotta explain. I don't understand the question. I mean, uh, the full price is the price that includes that good interest. Yes, the full price is the clean price plus accrued interest. So it includes the accrued interest. By clean price, what does it mean? Clean price means price without accrued interest. That's what it means. It's the price on the day of interest payment. Which is the same as saying is that when the accrued interest is zero. There is no accrued interest or the accrued interest is zero. That's, that's the meaning of, that, that's just the word's meaning. Means, plain means no accrued interest or accrued interest equal to zero. Dirty means you include both. So we would like to know that when we want to sell that bonds, yes. we pay for the uh, they pay for the full price or clean price? You always pay the full price. There's no stupid seller to ask for the clean price. Now here's the trick. When the bond is quoted when the bond, and that's where it comes, when the bond is quoted, when the bond price is given, they will quote the clean price. That's the clean price which they quote. But if you buy it today, you calculate interest from today. But if you calculate it three days from today, you calculate the full price three days from today. Do you understand now what's the difference? The difference is that when they tell you the quote of the bond is so much, they tell you the clean price. And everybody understands because the quotes will be probably close to the same for the week or for the month. So depending on how many days of the month months pass, you will calculate the full price by adding the accrued interest separately. So, 
Uh, now, here's the problem. If the quote is the dirty price, this means that every day they have to change the price to every day adjust the accrued interest. And that's too much hassle. But when the actual price, so we can call the full price, the dirty price, this is going to be the actual price. The actual price will include the in accrued interest. Let's see what else we got here. Again, you'll, uh, you'll have to get the textbook after class. Uh, we'll leave it in the library so you can make yourself copies. You'll have to read this stuff. It's not very simple. You have to read. You have to try to understand the examples. Let's see what else we got so we are finishing for today. Okay. Inventory price. Okay, this one is done. Well, how they are sold depends on the particular government. The U.S. will sell it one way, the German government will sell it a different way, the British government will sell it a third way, and maybe the Japanese government will sell it their own way. But the general idea is that the government will announce a sale of securities, they'll be issued on a particular date, and usually they'll give you, it's called an auction. If you want to buy, you tell them how many you want to buy and maybe what kind of bid, competitive or non-competitive. And they'll have the auction to be completed a day before they actually will give you the bond and you give them the payment. So, uh, let's see what else we have so I can complete. And secondary market is usually done with secondary market is usually done with bond dealers before we had money dealers and the money dealers specialized in broker or money brokers specializing in the money market so they will be brokers or dealers in the money market.